Hello, my name is Professor Mem, and lately I've been playing the hit new game Pokemon Brass and Lead. I guess it isn't so new at this point. Friend and fellow YouTuber Asiago Mateo practically forced me to play this game in order to make a video on it and its guns. In order to do that, I had to make it to level 45 to unlock the game's assault rifle, after which I would have all of the firearms I needed. This is an endeavor that took me 65 hours playing the game more or less normally. That's right, 65 hours to get a mere 7 guns in my hands. You see, people call Palworld Pokemon with guns, but that's a gross oversimplification. It's the same as calling Seven Days to Die Minecraft with guns. The two games have some similarities, and there are indeed guns, but many of the base gameplay elements are vastly different, and the guns are very few and hard to get. Given the way this game was hyped, I thought it wouldn't take me long at all to see all of the guns, let alone just get a single one in my hands. I soon saw that that wasn't the case, especially after realizing that there is no way to loot or otherwise acquire the guns. You have to level up enough to unlock the blueprints and then craft them, with crafting in itself often being a very resource and time-intensive process. Even though I only bought the game for this one reason, at this point I would have been content with dropping the project altogether so that I could work on other videos instead of getting as far sidetracked as I knew I would seeing this to completion. But Mateo wouldn't have it. No matter how many appeals, covert or overt, I made, he was immovable. Quitting would not be an option. He even went so far as to put himself into the game to make sure I was making progress. Very true to life, in Palworld, Mateo chills all day. Ah, finish the mission, you non-committal jackass. You have a job to do. What are you doing sitting around fucking... Just do it! Given that he was evidently successful, I at least want to justify the 133 in-game days I spent and the footage I got working up to the meager 7-gun payoff. This is a summary of my journey with Palworld. Fellas, I present to you the quest for the AR. Also, I pinky promise the first Battlefield 1 tier list is coming out next. Thank you for being so patient with me on this detour. Starting a new game of Pal World, I promptly chose an appropriate world name and played the game on normal difficulty with multiplayer disabled. Starting the character creation process, options were overall a bit limited, but I was able to faithfully recreate my spirit animal. On starting the game proper, one of the very few cutscenes plays. I wake up surrounded by the lovable bottom feeders of the Balkans, Chicopee, Lambal, and Kativa. Unfortunately, they get frightened and scurry away, forcing the camera to change angle and reveal my pathetic self. Considerably underdressed and looking like I've just woken up after the least worth it bender of all time, the implication seems to be that I've washed up from a shipwreck. Fortunately, somebody's iPad survived and the dead don't mind when you steal their stuff. Walking up into a set of ruins, I'm given control of the game. I proceeded hence and immediately found a freeloader sitting near a campfire at the cliffside. A castaway? Been a while since someone who didn't stink of pals washed up here. This island is a living hell. The people I came here with aren't with us any longer. These damn pals ate every one of them. You be careful out there. Here, take some basic supplies. You need to toughen up if you want to survive out here. I'm so tired. I tried making graves for everyone at first, but when more than a hundred died, I gave up on that idea. Here, ignorance leads to death. There's a sliver of hope to be had if you manage to tame a pal, but not one of my comrades was able to accomplish that. Hey, you have one of those ancient devices. With that, you should be able to make a pal sphere. If you make some, you can catch pals with them. You've got what it takes to be a pal tamer. Craft some pal spheres, get out there, and catch some pals. Pal tamers gain levels by catching pals, you know. Stay away from that tower until you get a little stronger. The rain syndicate controls that place. They're a dangerous group. You'll be killed for sure if you go now. My friends who tried ended up dead just like that. Well, all that seems very bleak, and not what I was really expecting. But even this guy's a shotgun, so I'm sure those aren't hard to find. Following the game's tutorial quest, as I punched down trees, crafted the most low-level items, and pondered my nakedness, I realized that this is not a Pokemon game, nor is it a shooter game. This is a survival game. Not what I bargained for, but there's no going back. After crafting my first Pokeball, or ahem, Pal Sphere, I pursued my first catch. You can't catch pals without taking some of the fight out of them first, so to speak. And my first pal just so happened to be the most adorable in the game. Lambal. Their pal deck entry reads, A walk up a hill tends to end with this pal tumbling back down. This causes it to become dizzy and unable to move, making it very easy to capture and kill. As a result, this pal is tumbled down to the very bottom of the food chain itself. I'm distraught with myself whenever I have to hurt a Lambal, and if I accidentally take one's health to zero, oof, it's over. I'm just emotionally destroyed. 
I set up my base in this flat, easily defensible area just outside of the ruins, which ended up being a massive mistake as there was a lot of unusable land within the base area. I built a modest cabin and a fire to cook my animal products. Strangely, you're given meat whether you kill or capture pals, so not all of this meat is murder. Nothing like a good late night barbecue. After making some clothes, I put my fellows to work. If you weren't aware, Pal World is a game that makes the slave labor aspect of Pokemon a lot less subtle. You rely upon them to automate important processes in your game. Although, the system is not perfect, as your pals frequently forget what they're supposed to be doing, abandon their duty, prioritize their tasks strangely, or go on strike despite the fact that you have them on the most lenient work schedule with plenty of food and beds, get stuck so they can't reach food or do their jobs, and seemingly despawn. This is a pretty major problem when you can't make metal ingots without fire pals, and crafting certain items takes a lot of time you don't have. Getting pretty fast at capturing these low-level pals, I refrained from exploring too far at first, especially since I didn't know the fast travel system. Back home, I found that cooking the very plentiful berries was decent free XP for a low level, although the F key needs to be held down in order to cook or do other work, so I found a way to prop my keys up to hold it down while I went to do something better. For a while, I obsessed over the shotgun model on this workbench. To have a weapon right there, yet sorely out of reach, was trying. I don't know about you guys, but nobody ever taught me how to get in and out of bed. Here you can see the clear Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild influence. Seeing as everything so far was pretty easy, I decided to trifle with the large green mass that roams around the starting area, which was an educational decision. One damage per hit was fairly less than ideal, and although I didn't know it at the time, if the lumbering moss clump were to land a hit on me, it most surely would have meant instant death. Nevertheless, seeing no progress, I abandoned the fight and took a lesser prize of a cat and some chickens on my way out. Ooh. On venturing further out, I finally found some foes that put up a fight. A little too much of a fight, actually. On death, you drop all carried items, but still have your pals. Thankfully, you can always get your stuff back if you make it to where you died. Sticking to smaller prey, I was making early progress fast. Although, as usual for RPGs and mobile games, this swift advancement would not last long. At level 12, I was able to craft the Meat Cleaver. When equipped, the pet command becomes Butcher. Butchered pals will not return. What the fuck? You're a new face. Don't tell me. An outsider? Not that it matters to me. Now that you're on this island, why not try to catch some pals? You can get extra XP for catching up to 10 of the same kind, you know. You know what they say, pal tamers get stronger the more pals they capture. Here, take this. I've got high hopes for you. Being believed in for the first time gave me the will to continue on. The skilled islander was right, catching pals would grant exorbitant XP that scaled with level, but only for the first 10 of each kind of pal that you catch. Finding and being able to capture new pals becomes paramount for leveling up at all later in the game. However, this isn't always easy with the gear available to your level. At this point, my equipment has low durability. Throughout the game, even pals with good capture rates will breach containment, and until late game, there always seems to be pals that, even though you can fight them, you can't capture them. Even getting them down to within one hit of death, the capture rate just isn't high enough. Despite your personal ability, you are gatekept from getting these stronger pals until you have the sufficient level and resources to craft the appropriate pal sphere. This high-level Mamorest, who was injured in battle with another Mamorest, didn't even give me one one-hundredth of a percent chance of capturing him. While adventuring in fairly rough shape, I heard the first sounds of gunshots. Ascending up the stairs, I came face to face with these pleasant-looking chaps ethically hunting the Balkans' fauna. Unfortunately, they killed a nocturnal pal I was trying to capture, so now we have beef. But that's a problem for another day, because after taking a few too many bullets, I was out of there like the coward I am. Back home, I got back to it, cultivated my crops, and made some ingots. Presently, harvesting metal was an insipid task, taking two or more often three strikes with a pickaxe to get one ore, and each ingot requiring two ore and considerable time to make. On top of that, my tool's durability and my weight carrying capacity frequently forced me back to base rather than allowing me to grind this precious resource, and this problem would persist for about half of the run. Ah, uh, you know what, that sounds like a skill issue to me. Do better. Returning to settle the beef with the fellows doing shitty cosplay of Death Gun, who repped the Rain Syndicate, I did them like they did me, and then put the fear of God into them. I tried something lesser men would be ashamed of. That experiment concluded with, well, at least I know that's possible now. I also found that these blokes weren't too bright, or too scary. Opening the cage that these goons were guarding, I got my first big boy pal, Arsox. Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. <laughs> he stayed in my party for the rest of this playthrough. About the party system. You can have up to five pals at your beck and call at all times, 
and at this point I had R socks, a Malpaca to ride around on, and a few Kativas since they increased my carry capacity just by being in the party. Fast traveling home after a narrow escape, I found that spark plugs are apparently highly coveted... crystals? Or debris? Or maybe data storage devices? And staring lifelessly at my inventory, I got this strange audio bug. If you recall the iPad from the beginning of the game, or the depressed cliffside freeloader mentioning towers, this is what they were talking about. The Tower of the Rain Syndicate, the apparent headquarters of the Ops, and the location of the game's first major boss fight. On entering, we're played a cutscene that shows off the true reason all these mask-wearing weebs are gooning for the Syndicate. The alt girl deploys a beast of immense proportion that proves the devs know how to steal from more than one IP, and the battle against Zoe and Grisbold begins. For the first time, I relied on my pals heavily during combat, and I just so happened to have the kryptonite for this boss encounter. Usually, the low-tier pal Kativa's punch flurry attack may not do much, being unable to catch enemies or just breezing past them after a few hits, but against a slow and large opponent like Grisbolt, who would allow Kativa to continually walk into him, many more hits than usual would land with one attack, and I had three Kativas in my party. After whittling them down to near death, I was disappointed to find that despite what I had seen online, it seemed impossible to make these two a part of my party. I, uh, didn't know the exploit until much later. After fading to black, I was put atop the Syndicate Tower to freely activate the fast travel point there. Back at the base, I had to repel a small raid from a Tokotoko implode unit. Wonder what that means. Well, I defeated them before they reached my borders, so I guess it's no big deal. After constructing a monitoring stand, I was given the option to increase the pal's workload from humane to cruel, or brutal. What exactly that entails, I'm not sure, because I never opted to do it. I'm depressed enough just looking at this icon. Remember, folks, that when you die, you drop everything, including your parachute. Also, remember to actually equip your parachute once you recover your stuff. Not knowing water was here, I probably should have died. But that aside, you might have noticed that what I was jumping for was a sign of human civilization, a small settlement on the first island. Ever explored a cave? I heard the caves are home to loads of unique pals. What's more, there are even treasure troves created by pals with a knack for collecting stuff. Give me a shout if you spot any caves, won't you? After having the game's dungeon system mansplained to me by a woman, I found a chap that claims to trade pals entirely ethically. Since I had a surplus of some of the more common pals, I decided to make a quick buck off of them, ignoring the obvious warning signs. Exploring around a bit more, I invented the correct way to climb a ladder. And air. I found some rare daytime depressos, yes, they're actually called depressos and their chief traits are nocturnal living and energy drink consumption, but I also found an aerial opponent that I felt up for challenging. Hitting arrows is easy enough, but whittling down the last of their health with a spear was expectedly a bit harder. I didn't bother with winged beasts for a while after this due to feeling inconvenienced. Exploring unknown regions, I happened across a normal and well-adjusted looking young man, apparently just enjoying nature and smoking his pipe. At least, that's what I assumed one would be doing, just standing out here gazing over the landscape. I trade in any kind of pal, whether it's stolen pals or even prohibited types. Take a look. The shady implications aside, this doesn't seem to be any different from the totally legitimate pal merchant we spoke to in the small settlement. So I bought the only pal that I could afford that I hadn't seen yet and went about my business. Clearing out a dungeon, they're pretty much all the same on the inside layout wise, but have some pals that you may not have collected yet, as well as a stronger than usual boss pal. But more importantly, they've got free stuff. They're rated by level, so if you're over leveled for a dungeon, it's usually a pretty good time. Easy pals and resources. Along with which strength of pal spheres you're using, your chances for capturing pals increases by level. But there is another way to improve your percentage. You can collect Lift Monk effigies to level up your capture strength, and while they seem hard to find at first, by far the best way to discover them is to go out at night. Reaching a high place, you'll be able to see them at great distances. Ow. My frame rate would often chug in new areas, such as this place where I discovered a sealed realm and the most unnatural natural formation I've ever seen. As usual, everything changed when I got the grappling gun, although I didn't know it quite yet. The earliest version had a short range and an unbearably long cooldown time, as well as sometimes just not letting you grab onto the wall you grappled, making it feel frustrating to use consistently. Repelling a raid from the Syndicate, who apparently still had something to fight for, presumably revenge for slaying their e-girl, I found my defensive traps meant basically nothing. Also, it's very jank that enemies ignore all attacks and have a completely one-track mind until they get a handful of meters into your base, then the fighting really begins. All of your pals help out with combat, but they can cause a lot of collateral damage to your structures, and there's almost always one or two enemies that get stuck back at the raid spawn point until they either despawn or you put them out of their misery. 
Returning to the awful rock stairs in the sealed realm, I found an empty room. Huh. Well, that's weird. Psych! This oversized penguin started kicking my shit in, and Kativa seemed a little confused himself. After taking inspiration from his tactics and exploring the architecture, I got one of my first boss pals, and the only pen king I would see for a very long time. Further exploration allowed me to marvel at the Balkans' impressive rock formations. And the... the, uh, whatever this stuff is. Cresting the thing, I spy some new human enemies doing battle with the dangerous Cinemoths. Oddly, they seem to be from a faction called the Free Pal Alliance, which makes me question what exactly their mission statement is. The Cinemoths easily overwhelmed them, but it seems in the crossfire that a few had turned on each other. Pal on pal violence is truly tragic. I get up close and personal with a few of these FPA devouts, and can only surmise by their garb and refusal to use firearms that they are cultists. After they're dealt with, I pick up where they left off. What makes me better than them is that I never touted freedom, and everyone knows a hypocrite is the worst kind of person in the world. Well, it seems I was overconfident. Well, it's just a short trip back to get it- oh, Jesus. That wasn't even my fault. I feared I would have to give this guy a wide berth, but thankfully he gave me one instead. Galeclaws threatened to do violence upon me en route to the big drop, but my running ability was too strong. After defending myself from another raid, I found these two lobotomites chilling in the nearby stream, and took advantage of their vulnerability by successfully capturing one of them. It was at this point that I considered I might be... a bad person. But I did give him his own name, which is evidently more than anyone else had done for him, so I'm probably not that bad. I guess exposure breeds tolerance. Like, in case you forgot that you're running a forced labor camp here. Back in the field, I was making new captures, and figured out that rather than being random, I could consistently get critical damage by stabbing enemies in the eyes. Taking a look at the tech tree for the first time in a while, I'd finally reached the level to craft a musket and its ammo. This was on my second day of playing the game, by the way, in case you've forgotten how long it takes. However, I couldn't make it yet. I chose to prioritize armor considering how often I was dying, so I needed to get more metal, and even then I would need high quality pal oil, which I didn't know how to get. At this point I started deploying arsocks with regularity, especially on groups of humans whose survival I didn't care about, like this camp of cultists. I grinded lift monk effigies, I raided camps, and I got those XP bonuses. The next day I logged in, I noticed that I had inexplicably transitioned and learned the correct way to travel, though this did not last long. It was also at this time that I started streaming the game to some of my friends and activated my microphone on OBS. What the? <laughs> Stop moving. Oh my god, see how low the fucking capture rate is even with the best Pokeballs? It barely went up! Do you know how much these Gigaspheres cost? I'm gonna fucking kill myself. This is why we don't try to capture these guys. Yeah. Well, you don't need to get to you can't anymore. Fight and blast! Well, let's take a look. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Yo, why does your dude look different? Does he? <coughs> Never mind. Finally able to craft the musket, I did so as soon as possible, and in the course of trying to admire it, was given the perfect opportunity to test it. While not the first, flintlock muskets are one of, if not the earliest form of handheld firearm that the lay person would recognize, so it makes sense as your first firearm unlock. But since I am much more interested in metallic cartridge firearms, I was admittedly a bit disappointed. However, I soon got over myself after seeing how much damage the musket does. It didn't take me long to decide to overproduce its ammunition, predicting correctly that I would use this thing heavily throughout the run. I could cope with it being slow, and in a way, despite how it's kind of corny to get a musket as your first craftable firearm, the sheer damage somewhat felt like a fitting payoff for having to wait so long for a gun, cementing that the player's guns would have a big impact on the game, even if there were few of them. Also, since it took me so long to be able to make the musket, I was also able to make the makeshift handgun shortly after, which uses the same ammo but is much faster than the musket. While the makeshift handgun was also very powerful, it only did one-fifth the damage of the musket, and so was much less efficient on resources to fire, so I didn't really use it. While the musket sometimes proved more powerful than I intended, for the most part its extreme damage was a great boon. At the same time, I had discovered another game changer, slide momentum. While you slide downhill, you gain speed faster than the player's running speed, and if you can transition this into a glide, you maintain that momentum, allowing you to cross great distances with the glider. While I used this heavily, not a ton of usage is captured on video. I made a few more big captures, a Boss King Paka and a Lucky Ruby. Lucky Pals can be identified by their larger size and persistent sound and glow that emits from them in the wild. Apparently, I was very happy about this catch. Uh, 
Another day, another inexplicable transition. <laughs> what the fuck are you wearing? I worked my way up to the handgun, though predictably I didn't use it much due to resource efficiency. In fact, instead I chose to really overproduce coarse ammo for the musket. So slow. Without having to worry about ammo expenditure much anymore, the musket was my go-to tool for most engagements on my level. Meanwhile, my go-to tool for getting around was showing off some of its own quirks. Some two inches could make a w what the fuck is going on? My lucky Lambo nearly broke my heart when it demonstrated a new move I didn't teach it. In an attempt to cross the water, I made a very interesting discovery. When I dismounted my King Paka in a section of water that was shallow enough for it to wade in, but deep enough for me to swim in, it put me under the water. No, it put me under under the water. I could run on the ocean floor, even glide, but not use my grappling hook. I followed the edge of this land formation until I found the edge of another, taking me to a strange and previously inaccessible island called the Number 2 Wildlife Sanctuary. When I got there, this ominous message showed over my head. I wasn't sure whether it meant that I was in danger or that I was the danger. On dry land, I saw rare creatures that I wasn't qualified to fight, but luckily found deposits of sulfur, which is crucial to the crafting of gunpowder. Mounting the mighty spires to their zenith, I still wasn't really sure what the purpose of this place was, but it was by far the most interesting place I had yet visited. The foreboding red tint lifted as I left its domain, making my way back to the mainland by a more conventional means. But soon enough I was back to it, mapping out the corner of a large underwater surface until coming back up for air at Mount Obsidian, a dangerous place if ever there was one. With my health being sapped by the heat, my rescue was a straight shot to a very luckily placed fast travel point to bring me home. After I made it, I admired the peculiar results of my subaquatic trek. Probably as some punishment for my exploits going under the water, the game tried to put me under the ground, but my legs are far too swole to allow such a fate. Returning underwater, I found something new, actual underwater topography. Unfortunately, this means I fell into an unexpected canyon, but my friend Mateo suggested a brilliant solution. Can you just hop a ride on him while he's floating to the top? Yeah. Oh, nice. More trouble, I was temporarily unable to discharge my weapon at a Capriti that probably would have kicked my shit in anyway. Back at the base, the quality of my production had increased, as had the quality of my, ahem, staff. There's no laws against the pals, Batman. And I made the Giga Grappling Gun, one of the items of all time. With the increase in range and decrease in cooldown, the grappling hook finally felt like one. With a much greater confidence in my ability, I took the fight to the Tower of the Cultist Hypocrites, where I found Mommy Lily and her indentured servant Lyleen. While I attempted to go easy on her so as not to tarnish her beauty, it's clear that she did not reciprocate despite my good looks far outstripping hers. No, in truth I was defeated with relative ease, and resolved to leave the nature girl alone for a while. Now that right there is a testament to the dangers of simpery. I turned my attention again to exploration. Having fabricated for myself some weather-specific armor, I was adventuring to exotic and far-off lands. My motivation to climb this mountain was insanely high with this kind of music in my ears. This attempt would end with me sliding down the mountain to my death before reaching the top. I'd gotten to the point where I knew I just had to put my nose to the grindstone and finish this run. I stayed up alone and listened to hours of music, true crime, and video essays. The age of the grind was upon us. Get him. Fight and blast. At one point, I had gotten up and left the game to allow my production to continue. After making a huge culinary mistake in my kitchen, I came back to find that I had made one in-game as well. This doesn't matter though, because it doesn't drop you below 1 HP, and I now had the means to craft the single-shot rifle. This character is just being introduced for now, but they become the hero later on. More exploring misadventures, I once again made a grave lapse in judgment while scaling a mountain. Oh. No! No! <laughs> no! But this gear was easily recovered after a very long and arduous climb from the other side with inferior climbing equipment. Coming down off this mountain, I once again found myself in a place I wasn't supposed to be. At this level, I also had the refined metal pickaxe, which made harvesting important resources much less insufferable, and was truly the point at which the game changed for the better. Help. I don't want to be here anymore. A giant scary pal attacked us. It chewed up and spit out humans like they were toys. You have to catch some pals and build a base before night comes. You can't win in the dark of night. Build a bonfire, hide, and pray until daybreak. Use this however you can. You have to survive and escape this island. I guess some people have it rough. I haven't been that much of a pansy in a long time. No, I'm kicking ass and taking names, as long as those names aren't Lily and Lyleen. Are you a castaway? What rotten luck finding yourself here. This whole area is known as Palpagos Island. 
Clearly, someone is a little lost. This is definitely the Balkans. There sure are a lot of freeloaders on this coast. I used to be a tough trainer like you. Then I took an attack to the knee from a giant pal. Further inland, I found a man dressed in a garb I had not seen before. And here I thought I'd finally escape that blasted desert. Nobody told me there was something that big living on this island. So it appears there are some folk living in the desert that I have yet to explore. However, I must not have given it much thought because, quite the opposite of going to the desert, I took another crack at the frozen mountain. Getting stuck behind the terrain again, this time it was a little trickier to get out. I had to use the height of my King Paka. Afterwards, I tried to make my way to the World Tree, but was sorely disappointed to find that it was inaccessible, which I kind of wasn't expecting considering that you can reach pretty much anywhere else you can see in the game. Fine, I'll go to the desert. Finding this structure, there was a surprising amount of people inside, and they all seemed to be talking about this guy Marcus, a man who seems to be both respected and feared. Marcus, a PIDF big shot, keeps this village safe. We can live in peace and quiet thanks to him. That's why it's a good idea to keep your head down here. Don't cause a fuss if you want to live a long life. What's this? A new face? Marcus controls this region. I'm guessing you knew that before you came here. Don't think you can have the run of the place just because you're a traveler. Just make sure you mind your P's and Q's. It's not rocket science. We swear allegiance to Marcus, and the PIDF protects us. Simple as that. The boss is a kind man to those who obey. He's even got the PIDF protecting us. There's a lot who thank him for that. He keeps the peace around here. But the boss is always around the tower with his officers. Wonder what they're doing in a place like that. If the PIDF can get their hands on some ancient technology, they'll be unstoppable. I bet the boss would be able to control the whole island. Bonfires are so nice. Nothing beats the crackles and pops of a roaring flame. Don't you agree? Back in the day, you couldn't go on about mundane stuff like this. Every day was a struggle between life and death, but everything changed when he came. Thanks to him, we can live like proper human beings. These days you can make a bonfire like this without having to worry about attracting thieves. This feeling of joy of something it's so simple. It's worth being thankful for. Hmm. Looks like it's about ready. Stay for a bite? Well, that interaction was pretty nice, but my narrative sense is telling me that there's definitely something suspicious going on here. I wonder where the tower was this Marcus and his cronies were hanging around. But I wasn't able to find it instantly, so I moved on to something else and promptly forgot about this clear setup for something interesting. Finding a new enemy faction, the Brothers of the Eternal Pyre, you can tell by their name and exclusive use of flamethrowers that this is a much more cultish cult than the Free Pal Alliance, but at least they're not trying to hide anything. Hilariously, enemies don't wake up to gunshots or aggro when you instant kill their allies, meaning that even though this was a gaggle of level 30 flamethrower-wielding maniacs, the damage bonus against sleeping enemies allowed me to dispatch them with ease. Another day passes and once again I spawn as a less beautiful version of myself. After finally producing enough ammo for the single shot rifle, I took it out for a spin. And let me tell you, despite being much less resource efficient for only 10% more damage, it was so worth it. This is by far the best gun in the game. It made me competent enough for taking on dangerous pals and the fire cultists that weren't sleeping. <laughs> Around this time I was using my grappling hook to faster travel along flatter ground, since it pops you into the air allowing you to actually cross the distance, when I figured out how to do this. By cancelling the hook while at top speed and deploying my glider, I was able to do a faster version of the slide glide on pretty much any part of the map. Between the refined metal pickaxe, the single shot rifle, and this new movement tech, the run was a completely different beast now. Never patch this. I went about intentionally using the grapple glide to elucidate those parts of the map I hadn't explored yet. I found a bushi absolutely max chilling. I found these vast ruins, and I found my way into a massive herd of reptiros, but my rifle alone was enough to dispatch them. I happened upon this structure which, unlike the random architecture and nondescript texture of everything surrounding it, looked very intentional and important, something I was not used to seeing in this game's environments. But unfortunately, there was nothing to be found here. Sniping's a good job, mate. It's challenging work. I guarantee you'll not go hungry. Solidifying my growing mastery over the Balkans, I crafted stronger armor something I had held off on doing until I was able to make the climate-controlled versions of it, since the desert, mountain, and volcano had all become frequent venues for my adventures. And then I went on a boss rush, finding and vanquishing all the world bosses that I felt properly leveled for. I had gotten far enough ahead that I could craft both the double-barreled and pump-action shotguns in sequence, though this was slightly delayed by a raid of airborne pals. Now that that was dealt with, I admired the new guns, knowing I would never use them over the single-shot rifle. I also managed to build the M2 Browning, and was so disappointed when I couldn't use it for myself. At this point, raids had become quite frequent and, as you can see, very large, but this was no issue aside from the property damage. 
After literally harvesting the fire cultists for their organs, I went back to challenging the forest milf and her Kuderite plant monster. Using firepower and the power of fire, things went much better this time. With the Queen Hypocrite dead, the highest evil had now been expelled from this world. Now my only goal was capturing new pals so I could reach level 45 and unlock the assault rifle, and my travels took me wherever I could achieve that. But, noticing that I didn't have a Grisbolt to demonstrate the minigun yet, I traveled to a new island, which I was told was the only place Grisbolt could be found. Not only was Grisbolt there, but the island was fully inhabited by pals I had either only caught very few of or never seen before. This allowed me to get just the free XP I needed. However, that ominous message was there again, and I would soon find out what it meant. Seeing some blokes off in the distance, I took shots as usual, but then something happened that I had never seen before, and then I realized, these guys weren't thugs, they were PIDF, the hitherto passive police force of this game, and not only had I unwittingly shot them in the face, but I was also apparently trespassing. That's what criminal activity underway meant, and now I was having my first encounter with this game's wanted system. In need of XP, I tried to ignore them and avoid racking up any further assault charges, but they were quite persistent. After reaching a high and empty place, I looked it up and found that leaving and re-entering the game would shed my wanted status, so I did that to save myself some time. It was only now that the game told me that this was the number one wildlife sanctuary, finally explaining what that meant and why the place was apparently off limits. I finished my poaching of endangered species without stepping on any more toes until I finally had the means to craft the assault rifle. I sped my way home, crafted it, and beheld it in all its nondescript glory, having finally reached the threshold of my objective buying this game in the first place. The only thing I had to do after that was get together the resources to craft Grisbolt's minigun, which didn't take long, although the crafting did. Thankfully Lunaris gave me some not suggestive at all help from behind. After getting inexplicably stuck for one last time, I was off to film my video. Ah, I'm sure it took you long enough, didn't it? Once again, still better. Now I can finally delete Palworld and all of this footage off of my PC. What would I say my thoughts are on this game? Well, it's still in early access, so who knows how much of this criticism will stand once the game is complete. I feel that Palworld is not my type of game. It demands a lot of time and grind for a game with no story to make it worthwhile, and while I like some survival games, I prefer ones where you don't feel so restricted at lower levels. In Minecraft, you're able to grind resources with extreme ease. In Seven Days to Die, you can find loot that makes you stronger. In Palworld, you can never earn an advantage. You can only level up. Furthermore, the game seems strangely empty. I am particularly put off by the metal structures on the mainland that are completely inscrutable. Settlements and people are only placed very deliberately. Fast travel points are distributed unevenly, with some areas having far too few. Between your weight limit, tool durability, and slow mining speed early on, making the all too important ingots is too time consuming. But Palworld is fun, especially when you come into your own later in the game. If a game cheeses you, you can usually cheese it back. The movement exploits were downright delightful to pull off, the power of guns finally makes you feel strong, and the game can be hilarious at times. Grinding for a high level is tough, especially when the goal is so far away, but I liked that this was the kind of game where I could just passively listen to YouTube videos for hours on end when I played it. And at the end, I genuinely feel like I'm at the point where the rest of the boss towers, which seems to be the closest thing Palworld has to endgame content, are within my reach. But the feeling of having game-given goals be accessible to me for the first time since the tutorial came too late and after too many days in a row of the same thing. Palworld may very well be worth hundreds of hours of playtime, just not to a gamer like me. I'm Professor Mem, see you next time.